Welcome to Music at Noon. I'm your host, Daniel Cabina, and I'm happy to welcome you into this space, the lobby of the Maureen Forrester Recital Hall. This is a beautiful space where we have the privilege to make music at the Faculty of Music at Wilfrid Laurier University. And this space, and indeed all of Wilfrid Laurier University's campuses, is built upon very beautiful land, the land of the Haldeman Tract, which is the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples, and which remains home today to a diverse community of First Nations, Métis, and Indigenous peoples, whom we honor and respect, and whom we celebrate as traditional stewards of this land. This is a land, and this is a tradition of friendship and stewardship that sustains us in all that we do here at Wilfrid Laurier University. It sustains us in our teaching and learning. It sustains us in our community building and in our music making. Welcome. Today on Music at Noon, we have a special treat. We have a guest. Oh, in fact, we'll become his guest. Stuart Goodyear is with us, and he will invite us into his space, into his home studio, to share with us a lecture recital on the music of Beethoven. Stuart knows the works of Beethoven with a special intimacy. One of his many notable performances uh, has been to perform all 32 of Beethoven's piano sonatas in a single day and from memory. Nor did Stuart do that as a, as a one-off. In fact, that's a performance project that he has performed numerous times, notably at Kerner Hall, M McCarter Theater, the Mondavi Center, the AT&T Performing Arts Center, and Memorial Hall in Cincinnati. Stewart has also recently released a recording of the Beethoven Piano Concertos with the BBC National Orchestra of Wales. Now, S Stewart's intimate understanding of Beethoven is that of a devoted and experienced performer, but it's also that of a composer. For Stewart is a writer of music and also an improviser fluent in many musical languages. Like Leonard Bernstein, for whom Stuart has tremendous admiration, Stuart's work as a performer and composer is enriched by a diversity of musical styles and seeks to reach out to diverse audiences, like us. So thanks very much, Stuart Goodyear, for welcoming us into your space, where already I'm making myself quite comfortable. Without further ado, Stuart Goodyear. start with this? Believe it or not, this piece, Fair Elisa or Fair Teresa or Fair Eliza, um, that's part of my last stage on my journey with Beethoven. Um, I'll tell you all about it in this hour or so. I was born and raised in Toronto, and um, I was surrounded by music of all styles. My dad, who I never knew, he died a month before I was born. He left a legacy of LPs ranging from rock and roll, Led Zeppelin, The Who, The Beatles, Cat Stevens, Joe Cocker. So that was my childhood soundtrack, as well as two boxes of LPs devoted to symphonies of two specific composers, one of Tchaikovsky, the complete symphonies of Tchaikovsky, and the other, the complete symphonies of Beethoven. And 
I loved Tchaikovsky, but there was something about Beethoven that just seized me and never let go, and it has been seizing me ever since. Um, I also grew up with um, this Greatest Hits compilation series, so every LP was devoted to one composer, and that would be the introduction for the um, common consumer, like myself, to um, explore composers and their different sound worlds. So, of course, Beethoven was part of that collection, and like every great its hits devoted to Beethoven, you had your usual suspects. For example, to forgive this piano, this piano is quite old and some of the keys are sticking due to the um, temperature, so we'll have to make do. Second track. piece that I played before. I'll get to that in a second. Uh... side was devoted to the fourth movement of the Ninth Symphony. And it was the second side that intrigued me because um, growing up with LPs in which every track from the Beatles and Led Zeppelin were um, the, uh, the maximum duration was around six minutes long. And then cut to hearing Beethoven where a track could be 24 minutes long with an endless supply of emotions and there were no rules as to how to respond to the music. There were no words and the individual would be responding to Beethoven's music from their own personal experience. That's what intrigued me and that's what turned me on to classical music in the first place. So here I am. Um, at the conservatory, of course, uh, when you entered, you heard students playing Beethoven from... And um, two doors down. occasion when you go down to the basement that's when you hear when that's when you heard younger students playing I think that's how it goes um, and here was sometimes it was which caused a lot of people to cringe I'll get to that in a second too um, I was entering piano competitions starting at age eight and um, Clementi was part of the um, um, part of the repertoire. Um, of Tchaikovsky, uh, Pinto. But I was waiting to play Beethoven, and. Um, Somehow, that um, the fact that um, it was eluding me made my attraction to Beethoven all the more stronger. The first 
sonata that I performed in competition was... first full sonata, that was just the one movement that I um, competed with, um, my first full sonata that I performed was um, the number two of that opus number, opus, opus 10. I still had yet to perform the so-called Moonlight Sonata. And that was later on during my journey with Beethoven. Um, I was dying to play the concerti. If I, if I was going to um, the Canadian music competitions during the final round, I would always hear contestants play. <laughs> No, uh, all due respect to Haydn, I love you. Um, fast forward to um, my days at Curtis. I was 15 and I studied um, with Mr. Leon Fleischer. We um, shook hands and uh, the project for my second year at Curtis was to learn a uh, Beethoven Sonata every week, learnt, memorized, and um, perfected almost to performance level. And um, he had mercy on me. He gave me two weeks for the Hammerklavier Sonata. Thanks, Leon. And so that was one of the most exciting years of my life because I was thinking, finally, these were sonatas that I grew up listening to that I was finally going to have under my fingers. Now, let's go back to um, when I was around three or four. I told you about the box sets that I heard. I heard the Beethoven symphonies. The only sonatas that I heard were The Moonlight and on occasion, to hear um, the um, Appassionata, the Hammerklavier, and Opus 111. And then I coaxed my mom one day, like the pianist that I listened to on LP was Vladimir Ashkenazi, and Sam the Record Man, which was this iconic store in Toronto, I would go there, I would try to go there every Saturday uh, with my puppy dog eyes saying, can we go again, can we go again? So my mother and I one time went to um, Sam the Record Man, and during those days, the classical section was the largest section of the record store. And I was in um, vinyl heaven. And I went to the Beethoven section, and I saw this large gold box set of the 13 LPs. Sonatas 32, which to me was a big number, by one composer, played by one pianist, and I thought, I have to get this, I have to get this. So um, I went home with this 
huge box set, opened it up and devoured it like chocolates, going from one LP, uh, from the first LP to the 13th LB the whole day without realizing that I didn't have lunch or dinner. I was gorging on those um, confections of Beethoven and just being completely riveted, moved almost to the point of crying. Sometimes I was frightened. I was la laughing loud. And already at age, it was around me before I was listening to these sonatas, I felt like I couldn't articulate it, but somehow I felt like I was going through the entire human human experience from sadness to love to tenderness to defiance to heroism to vulnerability and um, it just covered everything so I was very very excited about that um, so fast forward to Curtis my second year going through all of those sonatas and they felt so intimate to me and um, I didn't yet have the courage to um, program the sonatas on a, on a concert program like a regular human being would. I was thinking, you know, I know these pieces so well and they were, uh, they, um, they seized, they seized my soul um, for a lack of um, a better expression. Um, I, I just thought they were, that these were perfect gems and I had this idea that they were one complete set and to take one sonata away and to put it on a program with a compilation of different composers felt like I was taking bleeding chunks. That was, that was, my, that was my thought process. Um, the um, second year went by. Um, we got through 25 of the 32. The project was not complete, but we got through quite a chunk. And I graduated from Curtis and went to Juilliard to study. And I didn't play a note of Beethoven um, except for the um, concerti, which was a very interesting experience going from that world uh, to me, the sonatas were like a personal diary, and the compose and the con and the concertis were um, um, ways of communicating with the public. That was a public music, and um, the sonatas to me were a private music. Another reason why I dared not perform it yet until I really understood my own private thoughts and to have the um, courage to share those thoughts with the public. So on I went playing the Beethoven Concerti, but I was playing a lot of Mozart. So um, it came from a very Mozartian sensibility, even the Emperor Concerto. And I didn't feel like um, I cracked my own way to Beethoven until the age of 32 when I finally thought, all right, it was, it's do or die. At 32, I will perform the 32. It just turned out that way. It wasn't planned at all. It just happened just like that. At that time, I wasn't happy with my concert manager. I felt that I was going through all different directions. You know, when I was booked, it was just to f fill a void in the season and I was playing composers, which were interesting, but they were not, um, not composers that I was very passionate about. Not only that, I had to learn these uh, particular concerti um, over a very uh, short period of time. I had maybe um, uh, two weeks to learn one concerto. Thankfully, with that project at Curtis, where I was learning the um, each sonata, I knew how to learn pieces quickly and to really go, um, you know, from a composer's point of view, because I was also composing at the time, just to look at it from a composer's point of view and to look at the architecture, look at the emotion. And um, that was my way of um, having a photographic memory and learning these pieces inside out. Um, from a technical and musical standpoint. But these were pieces that I would only play once. 
and I would never play these pieces again. So I thought, you know what? I, I was just getting more and more and more disheartened. And it felt like I was going away from where I wanted to be, what I was really passionate about and what drove me as a kid when I was around four or five years old and the music that I would listen to at Sam the Record Man. So I thought, you know what? I left um, the management company that I was um, uh, uh, that was representing me and just decided, you know what? I'm just going to take uh, charge of my own career and um, focus on projects that meant a lot to me. One of them being recording my first love, the complete piano sonatas of Beethoven. And I started at age 32 with the final five sonatas, beginning with um, Opus 101. <laughs> closed the um, two CD volume, Beethoven, the late sonatas, with yours truly playing, finally playing the pieces that I grew up listening to. From that volume came the middle sonatas, which consisted of That's the second CD. The first CD was, whoops. Opus 31 sonatas. Then I thought, you know what, I'm getting very, very impatient. I performed the whole cycle of the 32 sonatas for the first time um, in Ottawa, the summer of um, 2010, 
um, at age 32. And that was one of the most important summers of my life because I felt like I was having a new breath, a new chapter. And that's what made me decide in one sweep to record the rest of the sonatas and release the box set. During that time, I also thought, you know, since these, uh, I am focusing on projects that I care so much about, I am just going to throw caution, doubt, and naysayers to the wind and perform the 32 piano sonatas the first, um, in the way I first heard it, which was in chronological order, all 32 sonatas in one day. And I called it the Sonatathon. And I'm going to be talking about the Sonatathon in the next part of this lecture. So the Sonatathon, which I performed for the first time back in 2012, was how I presented my first impression of listening to the Beethoven piano sonatas. And it was a very important project for me. And I felt more than any other body of work that there were so many relationships between the sonatas and it played out perfectly from a chronological standpoint. So um, for example, I would begin with the um, uh, sonatas that were first composed, which were the Opus 49 sonatinas. So I would begin at 10 o'clock in the morning, and um, this was how the sonatathon would begin. Second movement. Which leads right to Opus 49, number two. sonatas are in very, very clean sonata form. And I just felt like, um, you know, when you're spending a day with a compelling personality like Beethoven, you don't start with a profound heaviness yet. This is the official handshake. And then from those sonatinas, it goes from Opus 2 to Opus 111. And through this lecture, I'm going to show you, you know, why I presented the sonata on the way I did and the similarities of the sonatas and how one sonata goes into the other seamlessly. So we'll start with um, the F minor sonata. second movement this motif of course
course, we'll be coming back in the part two of the Sonatathon, which is in the afternoon with the Volstein. And then, of course, the last movement of Opus 2, number 1. And then the ending. With those triplets, goes right seamlessly into Opus 2, number 2 with the triplets. seamlessly to and then the ending of opus 2 number 3 having the same summer quality as the previous sonata of opus 2 number 2 and the pizzicato statement of C minor before we get into the pathetique and the the A flat major movement of opus 10 number 1 relationships from one sonata to the next. So the ending of um, 
Opus 10, number 1. Now, bum bum, bum bum, bum bum, bum bum. beginning of opus 10 number two and then the ending of opus uh, 10 number two a laughing octave passage from the previous one to the beginning of um, opus 10 number three now prepares us for the and the laughter of of laughter of of um jolly uh, um of jolly moments forgetting my vocabulary here now it comes an actor uh, uh, becomes a laughter of defiance <laughs> instance of G major and already it seems that the piano the um, piano hands are not together and they're just following the beat of their own drum similarly to with the hands not together uh, where are we opus 22, which ends part one of the Sonata Thon. So, that's the first B flat major sonata of the Sonata Thon, and the next B flat major sonata will be. And just like the two uh, B flat sonatas, there are similarities. One being a tearjerker uh, slow movement. So in the um, Opus 22. Now that we're 
uh, kind of running out of time. We're halfway through the examples of the sonata thought. I'm going to go uh, plow ahead. So that was part one. Part two begins. First sonata with theme and variations, um, but not the first example. Uh, um, let's see. variations. The last example, of course, being in um, Opus 111. To Second movement. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, from one sonata to the next sonata to the next sonata. Uh, Opus 31, number one. And with the second theme, it is not the dominant, but it is a third up from the tonic. Get that example in the Volstein from and a third up from the tonic, second movement. Third movement. And that. That almost trance like state is going to have another variation on that repetition in the Appassionata. Ends 
part two of the sonata thons. And then, over 78 begins the third part of the sonata thon. like the people are now winding down, sitting down and calming themselves with a warm bear hug from the stormy elements that were uh, the appassionata to something a little more serene before getting into the first theme. from Opus 2, number 2. Uh, interestingly enough, that is the last G major sonata that we will hear for that evening before... heard E flat major was two sonatas that we have absolutely no idea what the tonic is until much later plus solo elements we will hear a lot in the hammerclavier. Before going back to into with um, loud, soft, loud, soft. Taking um, that sound world from from the hammerclavier with the same chords as to. to the end. So those are the examples as to why I decided to do the Sonatathon. More than any body of work, it seems seamless and to me very very profound it has been such a great pleasure to talk to you about my journey with beethoven to me it is a subject that is um, very personal to me and um, since it began almost um, at the beginning of my life um, it has been a lifelong journey and it still will be i am um, grateful that I had the opportunity to um, record these um, 32 sonatas as well as the um, complete Beethoven concerti that this year the last piece of the puzzle for me was a piece that you never hear in conservatories 
you never hear in universities, but ask anyone um, outside the concert hall, outside the conservatories, outside um, a piano parlor, and you would always hear Fair Elise, um, a favorite piece of many. And it was a piece that um, I dreaded. And it was a piece that, of course, I heard countless times. So I had to almost rid that earworm that I had as a kid. I was almost bombarded with it at school, elementary school. Um, people would always want you, uh, want you to play that, even more than... Last year, I had a chance to just order the Baird Rider score of Feralisa and just had a chance to see it without any slurs, without any dynamics, and just, you know, try to approach it like um, I was approaching a bagatelle I never knew. And I guess through my um, history of playing the sonata -thon seven times of reacquainting uh, myself with the five piano concerti and the choral fantasy and hearing the symphonies over and over, somehow I just felt ready to finally tackle this seemingly simple bagatelle. And I guess because it was so deceptively simple, that was probably what scared me. Um, it was definitely a piece that can easily imitate another interpretation so i just made sure not to record or not to hear any recordings so um it was just myself this old piano here and the baron writer score and i became obsessed with this project of feralisa practicing the piece three hours every day and just dissecting it and just um, basically playing it as written in terms of just the markings, which has absolutely um, no slurs at the beginning. There's only um, the pedal. And the pedal for me is not the romantic pedal, it's the classical pedal. So all of this I was taking into account and um, trying to rid myself of the and seeing how I would phrase it um, by taking into account that the first two notes is the upbeat to so simple with that before in that 
vain. It didn't seem to be a heart on a sleeve bagatelle. To me, it was more of a courtship or if you are interested in someone, it's not like you are seeing someone who you're interested in in a crowded room and going, <laughs> it was more of a, interest without giving too much away and then the eye contact that is not too intense but a corner of the eye I always thought of this section same all right give a little more but not so much almost as if it's continuing in that F major vein and with the history of F major playing in my head with a sonata thon from symphony. I think the only instance of a very um, almost stormy uh, vision is the um, F major second movement of the Volstein. coming out of of a sore thumb to play the original second movement that Beethoven was going to come up with, which is... So, um, wisely, Beethoven separated that and made it a separate piece altogether. Now back to the F major for Elise.
repeating, you, you know the piece pretty well. I'm going ahead. <laughs> is pounding but nobody knows that but you piano um yeah that's basically all i could say about that piece it is three minutes and i probably took a lot of time on a piece that would be a uh, surprise uh, you know that would be surprising that i would um take quite um a chunk of this lecture on that but this was a very important Important project and it was a project that um, I, I obsessed with and just that journey to just make Feralise speak to me on a very personal level as opposed to just um, counting on count, uh, countless um, interpretations was something that meant a lot to me and you know I'm just really happy to um, to share that with you um, I just recorded Feralese just um, a month ago and someone told me, all right, are you going to do a blog about it? Are you going to do a music video? And honestly, I have absolutely no idea what I'm going to do um, uh, between you and me well, and, and anyone else listening. I have no idea. To me, this comes close to, um, to a music video or to a video testament, what have you. At least you know where I'm coming from when you hear the single. It comes out next month. A little self-promotion there, forgive me. The next um, step towards this journey is in May. I play this transcription of Beethoven Symphony Number no. 9. It's tough. <laughs> I'm so happy that, you know, there were, you know, the only um, the only bright light through the dark period that is that was the pandemic and all of the lockdowns was that it gave you know it gave me a chance to really immerse myself in the full score of the symphony as well as this brilliant transcription and all of the intricate details and everything, the harmonies, you know, that's another thing um, that is deceptively simple. All of the parts that we hold um, accessible in the ninth, um, it is so complex. You know, I, I, I wish I had three hours to just talk about the ninth symphony, maybe next time, but um, I'm very excited about doing it, um, even on the piano. And there will be four soloists um, with me and a choir will be doing it virtually. And again, it takes me back to my childhood hearing that old joy movement on that compilation Greatest Hits album. I'm looking at the time. I could talk for hours and hours, but I think my time is up. Um, ladies and gentlemen, students, faculty members, the people of Kitchener Waterloo and everyone else who um, have been tuning in to this lecture, I thank you so much for um, for listening and for uh, for giving me a chance to um, share with you almost like my life story. So 
take care of yourselves, stay healthy, stay safe, stay creative, stay excited, and goodbye. Thanks so much to Stuart Goodyear for sharing with us his insights and his beautiful interpretations of the music of Beethoven. How wonderful, too, to have the chance to be welcomed into Stuart's space, into his home studio. Thanks so much for being with us this week, everyone, on Music at Noon. Uh, next week, we can look forward to a performance by Joe Ferretti, Elaine Lau, Rich Burroughs, and Dave Klassen of two works by Peter Hatch, who is Professor Emeritus of the Faculty of Music at Wilfrid Laurier University. That performance will be uh, a co-presentation with Numis, and we'll talk more about that uh, in, the, in the coming weeks. Now, as is our custom, I'll, I'll extend to you the invitation, please, to lavish upon us your comments and feedback. We'd love to connect with you on the, in the online space, just as otherwise we would be connecting with you here in the lobby around these performances. So thanks again for being with us for Music at Noon. Until next week, be safe and be well and be making music. And now, not only has Stuart Goodyear been so kind as to welcome us into his home studio space, but now he's, he's agreed to stay in our midst for the next hour or so, uh, during which time Jeremy Bell and I will, will act as co-hosts and facilitate a bit of discussion with Stuart about Beethoven and Beethoven's piano sonatas. So do please join us. <laughs>